participatory economics, parikan, or a participatory economy? What is the actual name of this economic system? We'll discuss in this episode of Pep Talk. Could you please tell us uh, what you see as the alternative? Welcome to Pep Talk, the participatory economy podcast podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as a participatory economy. I'm your host, Mitchell Strapanchik, coming to you from Chicago. In this episode of Pep Talk, we will discuss the issue of names with regards to a participatory economy in the past and in the present. I am joined by two guests um, from Portland, Oregon in the United States. We are joined by Robin Hanel and joining us from Helsinki, Finland. Finland, I should say the name for the country, right, is Antti Jaihuainen. And so we will discuss the name and we'll begin up with Robin since you co-invented the model. Um, tell us a little bit about the history, about why you named it, why you named it. Michael Albert and I were the ones who had sort of created together this sort of model of how could a really good socialist economy operate? And, and we discussed for quite a while what name we should give to this model. And I mean, on the one hand, we were very much thinking of it as, as well, this is an alternative to all the other kinds of socialism you know, that people have ever talked about. Um, so, and, and on the other hand, we wanted to make very, very clear that the model was so different from traditional socialism. This is, I mean, we were talking about this back in the late 1970s and 1980s. So there was still a Soviet Union. There were still economies, countries calling themselves socialist economies, not just the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, but Cuba and China. Um, And we wanted to make very clear that what we were proposing was radically different you know, from what they, from what they were doing. Um, So it was always sort of complicated to figure out, well, what name or label should you, should we put on this? Um, And unfortunately in the world we live in, it's not just the idea, you know, that matters. It's the name you name something that will have a huge effect on who will take notice, who will find it interesting, who would bother looking at it, et cetera. Um, And so we, we argued about it a lot. And, and to be really honest, I lost the argument because I thought something along the lines of decentralized socialist planning. I mean, that was because I thought of, well, that's sort of a, the most accurate description I can think of of what we're proposing. Michael said, first of all, that's remarkably non-catchy. And second of all, you know, you're using the word socialism and that label probably wouldn't single people would not signal people how radically different the model is from what everybody in that era of time was thinking of as socialism. And so he was the one who said, why don't we just call it a participatory economy? My first reaction was, well, I mean, there are all sorts of people who believe in capitalism, you know, who think that we want to make capitalism more participatory and democratic. And, That name doesn't signal to them that, no, no, this is quite different than that. But there were pros and cons, and we ended up deciding we'll just call it participatory economy and then try and explain to people after that. Um, And I think that actually turns out, after 40 years, I'm very glad Michael won that argument. Um, I think that that was wise, although it lands us in sort of a, a difficult place in terms of what does this name mean to different people and how do we explain what it is we're really proposing? I was just about to say that. Yeah, yeah, I'm so Auntie, happy. go ahead. Yeah, I'm so happy that you lost the argument there. <laughs> uh, because I, I think there's a lot of good sides. Um, in addition, just talking about participation in itself, I think in the last 10 years or so, that has become um, more and more like a key concept for discussing democracy in general. That, you know, uh, having these abstract ideas of democracy that just isn't enough, but instead how much people can participate uh, in their uh, lives, in their communities has become um, more and more sort of uh, 
central theme in a lot of discussion about around democracy. Uh, so I think there's there are definite benefits to calling it that. Um, it's nice to hear that. Uh, but uh, then there's the other word, which is parikon. Uh, that's how I came to uh, uh, came to know participatory economy, uh, and also uh, the difficulty between economics and economy. Uh, I've always been of the mind that it should be economy. The economics always sounded strange but that's the word you robin used and that's also the word that michael has been using but apparently michael also came up with the um catchy in his view maybe uh word par econ is that right well yes um i mean michael titled you know a book he wrote um par econ life after capitalism and I think he had already come to be he had already come to to refer to the model of a participatory economy as pair econ. My first reaction to that was, oh, well, Michael, you went to a you went to a college called MIT where they don't have names for the buildings; they have numbers. Yep. <laughs> and so you know you. You just live in a different universe mentally in terms of what's an appropriate name for something, in terms of where everybody everybody else expects it to be words, you know, not something else. And then the other thing that I that that I thought had started to happen was, I always wanted this model and this idea um, to be something that would appeal to sort of ordinary people, and I thought, well, pericon sort of it makes it too cultish that if if calling it per econ means well nobody quite knows what that is you sort of have to become part of the cult and find out i thought that that's a little unfortunate so i've always resisted per econ and thought well it's too bad that and and look at poor auntie he still has a website in finland and it's called per econ finland i mean and the battle with that account and a Facebook account and a YouTube channel. I just checked. <laughs> okay. Well, Auntie, I mean, I feel sorry for you. That you've been saddled with this thing for historical reasons, and that's and that's the word that you first knew this model for, and you have kept it alive forever. Um, but yeah, the the other thing you bring up, the other the the other sort of more substantive issue is, well, should we call it participatory economics or should we call it a participatory economy? And and here's where Here's where, I, here's where I get a little particular. Because when you say participatory economics, well, we have Marxist economics. Um, we have institutionalist economics. We have neoclassical economics. Those are theories of economic thought. I think part of the reason that we started calling it participatory economics is Michael and I were always very, we, we were very self-conscious that our own economic methodology and theory was, you know, quite different, you know, from both Marxist theory and neoclassical economic theory. So we did think of part of our overall project as being we really need a better, a, a different and a better overall economic theory. But the actual proposals about how should decisions be made, you know, in a desirable economy, um, that proposal really is independent of methodology. It's independent of what sort of economic theory you're make, you're using. So at some point when we were already we already had a website. I mean, this is a fairly recent discussion that people on the on the the participatory economy you know dot org website went through about should we really continue to call this participatory economics? Are we really are we really out there proselytizing about a new economic theory or no? I mean, maybe we'd like to do that and maybe some of us do that and maybe that's a good project, but that's not the essence of what this is. And, and that, that is why I think that we sort of fairly recently moved over to, no, we're not, we don't call it participatory economics. We just call it, no, this is a model of a really good alternative to capitalism and all other kinds of economic systems that anybody else has been proposed. And, and so let's call it a participatory economy and not pretend that we are engaging everybody in a debate about a whole new economic theory. I wouldn't mind doing that, but it's just sort of a different project. Yeah. 
Auntie, Robin had interrupted you. You were going to say something? Uh, yeah, I was about to say that uh, throughout the years. Well, first of all, uh, the thing about Parikon, the word sounding cultish, is something I noticed when I was like 18 years old. This is sort of sounds uh, strange that I don't like it. Uh, it has the danger of uh, sort of over-promising and under-delivering that, you know, there's a single solution to everything. That's what that kind of catchy name tends to imply. Uh, and that's not a good approach to uh, fixing our, uh, our economy and creating a new one. Um, but, uh, and the other part is that I also remember when I was fairly young reading Finnish translation, which I helped do, um, uh, of participatory economics. Um, I remember it sounded really strange in Finnish because it, it goes directly to economics and in Finnish it's basically the science of economy. Um, and it, it, the word uh, directly refers to the science, the research of economy, uh, which the proposal isn't about. Um, and then, so I've always favored talking about participatory economy and it's, I think it's a good thing in English as well. Like Robin said, it's a very worthwhile discussion having um, discuss about economics as well. Uh, but like Robin writes in, in democratic economic planning, I think what is needed now is discussion about economic systems, economic models in general. And that's where participatory economy can really help. Uh, what is more, I think, is that um, if you talk about Paris Khan, uh, it tends to, in addition to some past discussion that has been around Paris Khan for 20 years or so, uh, it tends to imply again that there could be, you know, one solution that's just simply better than others, and that's that's the way to do it. Um, and I happen to think that participatory economy is probably, you know, the best, you know, solution in the scale that you know there's very few similar proposals that are to that scale, so well structured and and uh, that have an actual sort of economic uh, theory behind them. Uh, but at the same time, I think that it, it will not be that kind of solution at any point in the future. It will provide building blocks to a democratic economy, which I think is a goal favored more and more throughout the world in recent years. Um, and I think participatory economy can really provide, you know, very valuable tools to that discussion. Uh, it may not be the actual solution in the end, but I think if a concrete wide model like that can actually be discussed, can actually be compared, like, you know, in in years when I was one year old, uh, people compared capitalism and communism as actual economic systems. They could, you know, talk about what's going on with Hugo's plan in, in Moscow and, and so on, that they were actual economic systems. That could be discussed. Uh, I think participatory economy can provide to that. As a Finnish person, I'm, I have to add that luckily, I think the welfare state, the Nordic welfare state, has become sort of a, I would call it like like kids' bicycles have these. What do you call them? Like these helping training kids. wheels. Training wheels. Training wheels. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I I've started to think the uh, the Nordic welfare state sort of as uh, a training wheels for both actually economic models, advanced democratic economic models, but also for the discussion in general. I, I've noticed that in the United States, people have started to refer to the Nordic model as something that you can compare to, that, you know, what you have in the United States, should you have privatized health care? We have public health care here and so on. Uh, should uh, uh, studying at the university, uh, should you have fees and so on? We have free. Uh, uh, university universities here um, and that's the kind of uh, comparison that I like and then I think that you know when you think about you know the Anglo-American capitalism then you sort of step it up a notch you get the better model that's the Nordic welfare state but if you really want to you know have the premium option then you go for the democratic economy and I think that's where participatory economy is, is a very valuable contribution um, I wanted to 
Sorry, Robin, you were going to say something? No, no, go ahead. Yeah, I was actually going to actually quote uh, you, Robin. Um, this is a, I'm holding up a copy of a book you co-wrote, Alternatives to Capitalism, Proposals for a De Democratic Economy, um, which you co-wrote with the late Eric Olin Wright. Um, on page eight, there is a footnote here that is relevant to the discussion here, which I wanted to read. The model of, you write, quoting, the model of a participatory economy briefly presented here in this book was initially developed jointly by myself and Michael Albert in the 1990s and is now often referred to as PARICON. I do not use this acronym because I believe it conveys an otherworldly impression and fosters a cultish mentality I find detrimental to advancing discussions like this one among people thinking seriously about economic system change. Um, Robin, do you still agree with that assessment? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's, that was my reason for not being pleased by the, you know, the name Pericon. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I'll say at this point is this model has been around now for going on 40 years and a variety of different people have come in contact with it at different points in time by reading different particular things and have come to know it under different names. Um, and it, in the big picture, it just doesn't matter. Um, it means that some people who've been, and, and some people have been, you know, have taken to the model and have thought this really is a good idea. And they have gone on and, and they've talked about it themselves and sort of worked and organized panels and been on panels and they've talked about it themselves and they've used this name or that name to, to refer to it. And people are going to continue to use the names and the words that they're familiar with and there's nothing wrong with that. The other thing I was going to say about the, the Nordic model is I think it's very interesting. And here is where sort of political ignorance in the United States comes to play. So I, I think that Antti is, Antti knows that there is a Nordic model. And Nordic includes Finland and it includes Sweden and it includes Norway. And then he can, we can start to talk about Denmark and some, and, but if there is a Nordic model. Now that model in the United States was historically simply called the Swedish model. And Antti is absolutely, you know, on solid ground saying, well, you know, why did you call it the Swedish model? It's just as much the Finnish model as the Swedish model and he's right. But in the United States, it was and, and in, in, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there were leftists in the United States. Um, and I'm thinking of Michael Harrington in particular. And there was a there was a social democratic party in the United States, a little tiny one. And there they were very, I mean, when they talked about, you know, what is the alternative? Um, you know, what is the alternative that they were fighting for, you know, against neoliberal American style capitalism? That was what they talked most about. They kept saying, look at, look at what's going on over there. And they would call it the Swedish model, or they would call it, <clears throat> since they self-consciously were members of the Social Democratic International Organization at the time, they would think of it as, this is the Social Democratic model. Now, by the end of the 20th century, the Social Democratic model had become one that had come to accept certain features of capitalism like markets and private enterprise to some extent. So whether you call it the Nordic model, the Swedish model, the social democratic model, it still is sort of a far superior version of something that is still at least in large part capitalism um, than anything we have, you know, anything we've ever had in the United States. So, I mean, that's another thing that's sort of going on here in terms of the naming things and the understanding of things. Um, clearly our participatory economy model or proposal is a step beyond the sort of Nordic, Swedish, social democratic sort of vision of a very severely reformed capitalism that has a healthcare for all system, you know, that has education where, you know, you don't run up debts that you have to pay off your entire life to go to college type things you know, including very generous welfare states for people who are low income, et cetera. So that's another thing. To, and and there, there really is a disconnect in the United States because there has, 
one of the things that the that that the social democrats in the united states and michael harrington one of the problems they had in trying to communicate with americans was that you know when they talked about social democracy their their big problem was explaining that they were talking about something different than the soviet union and and they were they were talking and they were talking about what I think Auntie is absolutely dead on. They were talking about in the second half of the 20th century. Well, basically up to certainly from 1940 to 1975, there was a very vibrant version of capitalism that was distinctively different from um, neoliberal American capitalism. Far superior, served people's interests far better. Um, and and that was something that was that was was being built in Finland, in Sweden, in Norway, not just in Sweden. Um, and and the tragedy there is that it didn't keep moving forward. That it there was a tremendous retrogression in those Nordic economies back in a neoliberal direction, which which Antti and everybody over there is very familiar with and has been, bat been battling to try and overcome now for 20, 30 years. I'll talk about this regarding some of the points that both folks, um, Antti and Robin have mentioned in this. Um, there are two concerns I had with regards to the name. One is that it's kind of long. Participatory economy, 10 syllables. I mean, it's like if you want to, if you're giving an elevator speech, you're going to be halfway done with the speech with the name itself. Now, it, it, as Robin had mentioned, there are some advantages for that, and he's gone into some of that. But part of me is thinking it needs a shorter name. I mean, some people have, and I've done this myself, abbreviated simply as PE, participatory economics or economy. But that hasn't re really caught on either. And that seems like that's also runs into other things that are named with that with those initials so right. yeah one thing i do like and i've kind of also been using as well and it's kind of the the book that robin wrote and i contributed to democratic economic planning in the book that robin did write um some years back called economic justice and democracy that was the first time at least i had heard the term democratic planning regarding an economy and i like i like that because it's it describes what it is um, it is sh reasonably short, um, it seems accurate, and also can be mentioned as a counterpoint to the main rivals of command planning, central planning for, you know, the old communist economies or for markets and capitalism. So those are my thoughts on there. What do you think of that, Robin, Antti? Uh, can I say first? Yes, sure. please. Yeah, uh, because I really like it. Uh, the thing with that is that when, and I've used it in Finnish uh, in many of our events, uh, I think it conveys uh, to market enthusiasts very well that this is a planned economy. And that, that is, I think, something that is worth pointing out, that this is an economy, that it's a planned economy. Uh, but on the other hand, it also points out democracy very well. And that's, that's something even besides talking about just planning economy, but I think that really should be the focus of 21st century in general, uh, like you see in the United States in various ways right now, um, and elsewhere as well, in Finland too, uh, that you know we really should discuss democracy. And I sort of believe that democracy is in its infancy still, and that there's you know ways, ways, ways to go uh, how democracy will be developed into much more advanced versions in the future. So democratic planning is something I definitely like. I also like that it doesn't mention socialism, uh, even though technically I think it's obvious that you know socialism is an accurate word for for what kind of an um, uh, you know what school of thought uh, participatory economy belongs into. We're pro we're proposing public ownership of productive yeah, 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 resources. Yeah, yeah exactly. It? Yeah. So there's no but but the thing with socialism in general, I think, is that it's such a vague word for for economy or even ideology or socialism. It's basically ism ism or you know social. What you know where else can you have isms besides social, you know, social structures? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had a party. Uh, that's, social. Yeah. that's a very interesting question. I mean, yeah, 
somebody must have come up with the word socialism at some point in time. <laughs> and there must have been all sorts of problems with that. Like, well, what does that mean? And what do people <laughs> think of that? And when you think of the word social and ism, it is rather strange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were probably in one cafeteria in Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to say a couple of things to, to Mitchell's point. Mm. One is that that PE for 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 leftist economists in the United States, if you say PE, and then you say what they think is that's political economy, right? And that is the code word for some sort of economic theory and methodology that is different from in op and in opposition to neoliberal economic. Mm -hmm. So we have whole departments of economic, well, <laughs> in a few universities, at certain points in time, we were fortunate enough to have some econ departments with graduate programs and PhD programs that even featured something they called a political economy program. I mean, at my university, an American university, we had two tracks. And though they had two different names, the, they, they were either called the political economy track or they were called the mainstream economic track. And you took somewhat different classes. You took, you took different comprehensive exams to get your PhD. Now, at the time, those of us working in that system, we called it the straight track and the crooked track. <laughs> But there's already a lot of people who, you know, who, who associate the word political economy with something that it's not our specific model of an alternative to capitalism. Um, again, there was something else that you that, that you had said, Mitchell, that I was thinking of, but it's I've lost I've lost my, my train of track on that. That's what okay. do you think of democratic back. planning? Uh, I mean, I, I was asking Robin that. What do you think of democratic planning? Oh, yes. Well, I used it for, I did call it, you know, <laughs> the last title for the last book I wrote, you know, I used it. Um, I think that one of the problems with it is if you look at actual models and you say, well, if you just call it and you, and you say, and you use the word democratic planning, if you ask me, is the Pat Devine, Fikrit Adaman model a model of democratic planning? My answer would be yes. If you ask me, is the cockshot Cottrell, what I call the Scottish model, because they're both from Scotland, um, you know, a model of democratic planning, I'd say yes. So it's like we can't call that the name of our model. That's it's it's too broad. To cover. There are other models out there now, you know, that we are trying to engage in some sort of, you know, productive exchange of of sort of pros and cons and analysis. And then the other thing is, for the public at large, what democratic planning would mean, I'm trying to think of trying to think of political figures in the United States who, you know, in the in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, who were arguing that while we while the while the US economy was going more neoliberal and getting away from various planning programs that had come in during the New Deal, you know, and been sometimes further developed and that there were people who were essentially saying, we need to get back to doing more democratic planning rather than less democratic planning. And they're probably out there in the literature and the public mind. I bet that phrase in the United States is more associated with people like Felix Roy Hatton was sort of a, a well-known writer at the time who was you know, arguing strenuously that this trend away during the 80s and the 90s from, from more planning in the United States was just, you know, have, was having detrimental effects on the economy and the well-being of people. So I, I, I just think that word has been used, that those democratic planning has, has been used for so many other purposes that we couldn't possibly let people know that our model is just democratic planning. I mean, that that that's that, that would be my concern with sort of taking that on. Yeah, and and it's fair. It seems like it's a broader category than this particular model, which is given given the name of a participatory economy. So yeah, let me say something about democracy too. Yeah, that 
part of the reason that I have liked the word participatory is that there really is a difference between the common conception of democracy is there's a discussion and there's a vote. And, and so you might say, well, if you want to have a democratic economy, then we basically need to set up a system where you have a discussion and then a vote on a vote on everything that we are going to do. And part of what we've said is that's a real misconception of what democracy is required in an economy because we have made, I think, an incredibly useful distinction um, between, we said, look, there are some decisions that affect people more or less equally. And then the democratic way to make that decision is pretty much everybody has one vote. But in the economy, most decisions affect some people a lot more than other people. And what you want is to try and put together a set of decision-making procedures that allows people to participate much more heavily and have a bigger weight in making a decision that affects them much, much more than it affects other people, and particularly in workplaces. I mean, what's produced in a workplace and how it's produced, clearly that affects the workers in that workplace. You know, yeah, it affects other people too. They use resources that belong to all of us. You know, the, the, what they produce affects consumers. But there's, a, there's an important sense in which some economic, and I thought our conception of what we call, you know, our definition of economic self-management, I think highlights that. And it's such an important idea and it was so big a part of the, it was such a big part of the mistake that the quote unquote centrally planned economies made in the 20th century. And it's not just enough. The idea is, well, suppose you took the totalitarian features away. You suppose you took the communist party as a single party away. Suppose you took Joe Stalin away and you made this whole system as democratic as possible, democratic in the sense of everybody gets to vote. Is that really what we want? And, and my, I, I'm, very I'm very convinced that isn't what we want. That, doesn't, that just doesn't deal with the fact that, no, we have to design something where workers get to participate in managing themselves in a much, much more important way than that, and consumers as well. And so that, that's the other reason that I think that, that just calling it democratic planning or democratic economic planning, I think. One of our best contributions is we've sort of explained, no, it has to be more participatory than that. Um, it's more complicated. It needs to be more participatory. Um, and in some sense, the whole or I mean, in the United States, I know this is not I, I know that there was no was there really a new left movement elsewhere? There was a new left movement in Europe, but there was such a strong sort of socialist movement in all the European countries that it was sort of something coming on. It was something that was a, a sort of a slight modification. But in the United States, where McCarthyism had stamped out the old left, then in the 60s, a new left came into being, I, you know, student groups like SDS, and their whole place of origin was, we need to make the economy democratic. We need to make, we, we need to make, we, we, People who are workers need to be participating in making the decisions. They shouldn't be, be made by their employers. And, and so that, there's another dilemma there in terms of what words do you use? What do they mean to different people? What's the important part of what you're trying, that you're, what's the important part of what you're saying that you're trying to convey with the words you're, you're attaching to it? I think we will end it here. Um... I've been joined by Auntie and Robin. This has been Pep Talk, the participatory economy podcast, the podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as a participatory economy. To find out more, you can visit the website of the Participatory Economy Project at participatoryeconomy.org. 
There you can read and uh, read up on the uh, model of a participatory economy. You can sign up for a monthly newsletter and you can participate in an online forum where these and many other issues uh, are discussed or you can bring up issues of your own. Um, this has been pep talk uh, for Auntie in Helsinki and Robin in Portland. This is Mitchell in Chicago. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Could you please tell us um, what you see as the alternative? Self-management, democratic control of communities or workplaces, federal arrangements. Participatory democratic planning. Jobs found a mix of empowered your nesting councils linked to one Everyone gets to participate in a primary council. Please visit participatoryeconomy.org to find out more and subscribe to our newsletter. And don't forget to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to our channel. Thanks, and see you at the next episode.